Well, tonight's presentation is uh, going to be by Dr. Michael Workman, and he's going to, his presentation will be Parkersburg, Guardian of the Union. And uh, I find this very interesting because he's going to discuss the Civil War history of Parkersburg and Little Kanoa region, and uh, the role that it played towards statehood. Uh, and I, that's an area that uh, I think is very interesting in history because, number one, it's interesting because I don't know a whole lot about that, that particular area. But uh, Dr. Workman is a his, has been a historian for the Institute for the History of Technology and Industrial Archaeology at WVU for a number of years. He has been an assistant professor at West Virginia State University since 2010. Uh, he has written and published on labor, industrial, and West Virginia history. His latest manuscript is a study of the Civil War as it impacted Parkersburg and the Mid-Ohio Valley. And I would like to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Dr. Michael Workman. Well, thanks for the uh, great introduction. Can everybody hear me pretty good? Can you hear me pretty good here? Pretty good, pretty good. Okay, I'll try to project my voice uh, so uh, I can be heard. So I'm really uh, grateful to get invited here again. Uh, and uh, I'm really proud of some of my work on, uh, on this particular project. Uh, a lot of the resources that I use for this came from this archive, this library. Uh, so it's fitting that I talk about it here. I talked to a few of you and uh, found that uh, several of you seem to be from Parkersburg, Par Parkersburg area. So uh, if you uh, have some uh, historical knowledge that uh, you think I need to know about or have a comment uh, during the talk, just go ahead and uh, speak up. That's no problem with me. Uh, you could raise the issue while we're going through and then at the end we could fully discuss it. So we'll have some time for questions and discussion at the end. But this was a project that uh, I took on as a consulting project uh, way back in uh, 2010 or even 2009. And the idea was to produce a historical context uh, for uh, Parkersburg during the Civil War. Uh, sort of do it in support of uh, Civil War commemorations uh, during the sesquicentennial. So I started working on it. It actually took quite a while to get this uh, manuscript completed. It was 107 pages at that point. Uh, I have since, uh, after it was finished, uh, done some additional work on uh, the uh, so-called guerrilla warfare in uh, the Little Canal Valley and in, and in that wider area. And in fact, it is really some of this work uh, on that uh, part of center guerrilla warfare uh, that I have some fresh research that I want to present. Uh, but I do will say some things about Parkersburg. Uh, this is a uh, pretty famous illustration of Parkersburg uh, during the Civil War. Of course, that's the Little Canal River flowing into the Ohio. And uh, at this time, the uh, railroad, the Northwestern Virginia Railroad, which uh, link to the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad at Grafton had just been completed. And Parkersburg was sort of a sleepy little river town, but it was during the war with all of this uh, activity, all of the Union soldiers and supplies and new uh, businesses uh, coming in, new people coming in uh, that made Parkersburg, made it into a, a modern important city. And that is, uh, I think, uh, certainly true. So uh, let's move on and see what we've got. Well, this uh, first part of my talk is going to deal a little bit with uh, uh, the statehood movement and the way historians have viewed it over the years. Uh, 
after the statehood movement and well up into the 1950s, uh, historians interpreted statehood in a certain way. It's often called the heroic school of interpretation. And this was done by some of the people who actually participated uh, in the movement. For example, uh, Granville Hall wrote uh, uh, a reminiscent account. There are other reminiscent accounts. And then also by a whole host of uh, historians at West Virginia University, including the very famous Ambler, who wrote uh, at least two or three uh, monographs dealing with this. And the idea that, uh, that West Virginia's creation was uh, the efforts of a group of uh, Western Virginians uh, to throw off the yoke of tyranny that uh, Eastern Virginia had laid on them, denying them political equality, denying them public education facilities, denying them internal improvements, and uh, demanding that they get political equality and freedom. So uh, this was the idea, this was a great event, it was sort of, uh, in one uh, words of Granville Hall, the, the dream of generations had come true. So you have this sort of heroic uh, flavor to that, uh, and that sort of uh, was the main way of interpreting uh, statehood until uh, the 60s and 70s. And we had a group of revisionists who took some shots uh, at this uh, traditional sort of heroic view. Uh, one of them was the fellow there uh, on the right of the screen uh, who is uh, formerly a professor at State. Does anybody recognize that fellow? Stuart McGee. Stuart McGee. Stuart McGee was a historian, uh, but he was also something of an agent provocateur. Uh, the way he wrote and the way he spoke in public was to provoke people. And a lot of people didn't understand that when they heard him talk and they got upset with him, but he was just provoking, trying to get discussion. He wrote an article, uh, actually a pretty popular article, and actually gave a series of talks about statehood. The title of the article was The Tarnished 35th Star. So you can expect uh, his interpretation would not be very favorable uh, to West Virginia statehood. And there were others that, uh, uh, that wrote about uh, with a new view towards uh, statehood. We'll mention Henry Wise. He was definitely not a historian, but he was an actor in this whole episode, the Civil War. And he had some very choice remarks about West Virginia that we'll see here in a minute. And then uh, Richard Curry wrote a very influential book, uh, House Divided, which looks at uh, statehood and then the division of West Virginia uh, during the Civil War. And then John Alexander Williams, who's probably one of our most famous historians, uh, they began to criticize this view and uh, they criticized it in, in two or three areas, actually three areas that I've listed there. Uh, the first had to do with the fact, or with the interpretation that uh, uh, West Virginia was created illegally and against the U.S. Constitution. So the first thing we, we looked, we'll look at here in a second was West Virginia legally a state. And I, people actually uh, are questioning this even today. I'll show you here in a minute the, uh, an internet site that asked the question. Uh, was West Virginia a legal state? So that's the first issue, constitutional issue. Was it accomplished uh, according to the United States Constitution? And then the second issue has to do with, with slavery. Uh, and to me, this is, this is one of the most serious issues. Uh, the idea was uh, in the heroic school, some people uh, got across the idea that statehood was sort of an abolitionist crusade that uh, West Virginians fought against Virginia, against the South, uh, to free the slaves, to emancipate the slaves. This idea had been pushed. Well, the revisionists uh, uh, saw the problems with that particular view. It simply was not true. Uh, however, the uh, people of West Virginia, if you look at the, what they say, they did have anti-slavery views. And I'm gonna expound on those here in a minute. 
So I think in terms of uh, both these issues, slavery and the uh, question of legality, uh, people who have used this revisionist point of view are guilty of interpreting the past with the values and ideas of the present. So it's called a presentist uh, fallacy. They look at West Virginia in context of what happened after the state was founded, after Virginia came back into the Union. And they look at slavery in terms of the slavery issue in terms of just saying no, uh, West Virginians were not abolitionists. But they don't elaborate on what sort of anti-slavery attitudes Western Virginians have. And then the third issue relates to uh, how the state of West Virginia was formed up uh, with uh, considerable areas that actually were loyal to Virginia and did not want to become part of West Virginia. This is what I call the geography issue. Uh, and this led to the guerrilla war and what I call civil war within a civil war. But there is some validity to this uh, view on uh, uh, the house divided. And we'll talk about that. That is really one of the important topics I'll mention here in a second. Let's look at Henry Wise. The unreconstructed uh, rebel uh, play a big role in uh, Virginia's secession, was governor of Virginia uh, from 1856 to 1860, and uh, was also a military commander here in the battle. He uh, commanded a uh, what he called Wise's Legion that invaded uh, the Canal Valley in 1861. Uh, well, what is it about Wise that uh, gets my blood pressure up? Well, he said this. He said this, that West Virginia was the bastard child of a political rape. He said that in 1868, uh, when the uh, plebiscite for Berkeley and Jefferson counties was held, they were able to decide whether they were going to go into the state of West Virginia or stay with the Old Dominion. He said that as part of the campaign to derail that activity. Uh, and actually, as I mentioned before, this uh, on the internet is West Virginia legally a state. Uh, this is one of those kind of Ask Jeeves type uh, uh, websites. And the answers were yes and no. Uh, it's uh, uh, done in a irregular way, uh, could be considered unconstitutional because the state of Virginia had not given permission to West Virginia to secede. And then we have uh, some other aspects of revisionism, revisionism that has been expressed in an uh, online exhibit that has been posted on uh, this particular website from this institution. It's called A, a State of Convenience, uh, and just the title itself uh, connotates a, a less than heroic origin for uh, West Virginia. Was it just set up because uh, it was convenient to do so, regardless of whether it was legal or constitutional? And at the end, the very last article on that uh, uh, online uh, exhibit, uh, which by the way is excellent, it's excellent uh, in terms of the sources that it uh, has for the historian. There's an article uh, by this character, this fellow, Sheldon Winston, I don't know him, uh, maybe somebody here does, I'm sure he's a great historian, but uh, I quote from him. Virginia had lost a third of its area when an entire violation of the federal constitution, its western part had been torn away, organized and admitted to the Union as the state of West Virginia. Well, uh, you know, I'm almost aghast at this because uh, what was the validity, validity of this when uh, Virginia had seceded from the Union at the time. Uh, Virginia had repealed the U.S. Constitution. They had no rights under the Constitution. 
So for them to uh, cry about this, you know, I'm not going to shed even a crocodile tear for that. Uh, so that is the, the concept uh, uh, brought forth by the revisionist on, in terms of legality, constitutionality uh, of the issue. In fact, my, my contention is this was a, a revolution. Uh, it was a very unique event, uh, unique in all of American history. It was a revolution in the context of a federal system. It was the only successful revolution of that uh, Civil War. Of course, the southern states see it. They wanted a revolution, uh, but they failed at theirs. West Virginia was the only uh, state to succeed with its revolution in the context of a federal system. And that is uh, shot with a quote from Edward Bates, who was Attorney General, Lincoln's Attorney General. He said it was the original act of revolution. Another part of the controversy of legality, constitutionality, has to do with this uh, clause in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, this is the Article 4, Section 3, uh, and this is the basis for the methods that Western Virginia used to set up the new state. Uh, there has been an argument over this particular clause uh, in terms of the use of a semicolon, and uh, if you look closely at this, it's a very involved sentence, but uh, the key parts of it uh, is the second uh, independent clause that no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state. Well, the question is, does that end that particular uh, provision? Well, there's a semicolon there. It continues on. Nor any state be formed with a junction of two or more states or parts or states and continues with without the consent of the legislatures, of the state's concern, as well as Congress. Well, does that imply that uh, uh, the, the Constitution does not allow for no state to be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of another state? So that was the argument that uh, the semicolon put there ended that provision. Well, it's just silly because uh, most of us know that a semicolon is used to set off an independent clause, right? A sentence, a period, is used to set off or end an independent thought or a complete thought. So I think that is a, a pretty bogus uh, criticism of the constitutionality of West Virginia. Uh, the other way to look at this is to uh, examine the way Virginia actually seceded and the way that uh, Henry Wise uh, proceeded in that convention that was called to consider secession. Uh, according to an eyewitness account, Henry Wise, the guy who uh, had that statement that uh, West Virginia is the bastard child of a political rape, uh, the Richmond Convention uh, was deadlocked. In fact, it was trending towards uh, voting no against secession. And then Fort Sumter happened. And then the very next day, uh, former governor, Henry Wise, uh, walked into the chamber. He was not a member of this convention. He was not even governor of the state of Virginia. He walked into the chamber uh, with a horse pistol, which is a very uh, a large barreled uh, uh, pistol that was used, mounted on a horse, and uh, started waving it around. He's brandished this horse pistol. And he waved it around and he said, now is the time to act. You're going to uh, uh, either vote for secession or, or else. Uh, he sort of implied that. If anybody wanted to oppose it, they would, were going to have to take him on. He had already initiated uh, an action that would take over Harper's Ferry, the federal installation at Harper's Ferry. He had already sent men on his own initiative. So I ask you, is... Uh, is that a democratic process? Is that uh, 
uh, robber's rules of order, do they have that particular uh, move within it? So uh, we see that uh, they were acting, uh, of course, uh, in any, not in any democratic or any orderly manner in their particular convention. And for, for them to accuse uh, West Virginia of not doing things according to the Constitution, I think is a little absurd. And then we have the description that uh, was given uh, by those who went through this process. This is the uh, quote from Archibald Campbell uh, from Wheeling, who was a very prominent uh, statehood leader, uh, Republican. And you can see that uh, it, it took several steps to, for West Virginia to become uh, a state. Two years to go through all these various steps that uh, were related to uh, statehood. And I have the steps here in the next slide. I'll show you. This is okay. Here's the, uh, uh, the many steps that uh, the statehood leaders took. There were uh, three wheeling conventions, uh, including the Constitutional Convention, uh, several referendums, uh, were held to approve their actions. Uh, they submitted the, the Constitution to uh, the U.S. Congress and President Lincoln for approval. Uh, there, they, it was not approved at first because of the slavery issue, which I'll mention here in a minute. So you can see it took two years. What they, what they essentially did was to create a loyal state of Virginia they uh, saw very clearly that uh, Virginians had uh, vacated the offices of the state. They had uh, committed political suicide. They had seceded from the Union. So they felt that uh, uh, they needed to elect loyal uh, people to those offices and to a new legislature. So that was the way that they proceeded. And uh, once uh, the loyal state, or reorganized state of Virginia, gave permission uh, they moved forward and take it to Congress and then the President. So it took until June 20th, 1863, uh, about two years. Uh, and this was a revolution that followed uh, all the steps, all the legal and constitutional steps demanded by uh, the federal government. Well, how about the slavery issue? Uh, this is... Uh, Wakeman Willie uh, from Morgantown. He was uh, one of the leaders, uh, statehood leaders. Uh, there were uh, several very important statehood leaders from Parkersburg uh, that will come up here in a second. But uh, Parkersburg was one of the centers of Union statehood strength uh, during the Civil War. Well, was West Virginia an abolitionist crusade? Uh, somehow this, this idea got uh, put into some textbooks. Of course it was not. Anybody who reads much about that realizes that there were very few abolitionists in West Virginia. Well, uh, you can look at that as being a case of pure hypocrisy, that to advertise this being an abolition, abolitionist crusade when it really wasn't. Uh, in fact, West Virginians were probably more racist than uh, many in the South. Well, it's easy to condemn them. But uh, the thing that I'm suggesting is to look at this situation through the eyes uh, of the people that went through it. Well, why were West Virginians opposed to slavery? Well, it was not because they wanted necessarily to free the slaves. Uh, there was no real moral concern uh, with the slaves themselves. In fact, the perspective that they had was very similar to the Free Soil Movement that had arose uh, in the 18, early 1850s and really had been the incubus uh, for the Republican Party. Uh, free Soilers, uh, they hated the institution of slavery. Uh, they weren't particularly interested in emancipation. Uh, they simply wanted to keep slavery from expanding. They wanted to keep slavery from coming into their locality because it depressed uh, wages, depressed standards, 
uh, for farmers, uh, laborers, capitalists. So it was a degrading sort of institution that uh, did not permit economic development. So there were many reasons that they opposed it. But among those was not the abolitionist concern uh, with the fate of the slaves themselves. In fact, it was actually a fairly racist sort of perspective. So the first uh, constitution that uh, West Virginia submitted to Congress for ratification had what was known as the Negro Exclusion Clause. Uh, they were not going to allow uh, any African American, be they black, white, or <laughs> be they slaves or free, to come into the new state. So this is a, uh, a I think, a good manifestation of this uh, free soil idea, hating the power uh, of uh, the Virginia government, uh, which was able to increase its uh, power, its representation. Uh, in the General Assembly with its slaves. But also it did not tax its slaves for their for that full value. So this was not uh, political equality. Uh, Virginia elites were using slaves to augment their political power. So uh, after this was submitted, of course, by this time, uh, Lincoln was, was thinking about uh, issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. And uh, we had a recent talk uh, the McCright Lecture. Did anybody see the McCright Lecture? Nobody saw the McCright Lecture? Well, uh, Tim Holzer, I think was his name, uh, came in and spoke and talked about how uh, in Lincoln's mind, in his correspondence, uh, the West Virginia question and the Emancipation Proclamation question were interrelated. And uh, he, he wrote a lot, he thought a lot uh, about these two questions. They were interrelated. Uh, so what was done is that Congress uh, set a condition for the admission of West Virginia that uh, it would have some sort of emancipation. And uh, Lincoln at this time was uh, favoring gradual emancipation for the border states. This was what he was trying to to get across to the various border states, the slave states that did not secede. And this is what uh, was suggested for West Virginia. Meanwhile, uh, Lincoln did issue the Emancipation Proclamation, and if you read it closely, you'll see that uh, uh, West Virginia is excluded. This was an executive order issued by uh, Lincoln, and it simply said that uh, slaves in states and areas that are in rebellion. In those areas, those slaves would be uh, forever free. Well, West Virginia was accepted because it was not in rebellion, uh, as was uh, parts of Louisiana. Louisiana was going through a similar experience at the time. So uh, West Virginians went ahead with the uh, move to insert gradual emancipation in the Constitution. And uh, this was known as the Willie Amendment. Wait and Willie. But as they were uh, uh, working on this meeting and convention, uh, sentiment towards slavery was changing very rapidly between January and May of 1863 as this amendment was being uh, ratified. And uh, according to uh, uh, the leadership of Gordon Battelle of Morgantown, uh, there became more and more interest in, in abolition and anti-slavery views. So this was the changing. This is essentially what happened to people in the Civil War. They grew radicalized about slavery as this war got uh, uh, more and more nasty. As more and more people were dying and coming home without limbs, people get radicalized. That's essentially what happened. Uh, the country was uh, definitely not in favor of uh, emancipation in 1862, 1863. And in fact, gradual emancipation was ahead of the curve. Uh, West Virginia was the first uh, slave state to emancipate uh, its slaves. 
The provision for that is pretty interesting. Let's see if I can do this now. Here's the Willie Amendment. And read that, and uh, what you see is uh, that when West Virginia came into the Union, uh, it came into the Union as a slave state. But it was under the provision of gradual emancipation. And nearly every state in the North had freed its slaves according to gradual emancipation. In fact, uh, the state of Pennsylvania had slaves until the 1830s because they used this sort of provision uh, to do it gradually over the years. So uh, with this in mind, uh, West Virginia could have had slavery for the next uh, 30 or 40 years. But of course, it didn't uh, turn out like that because the country continued to be radicalized and uh, could pass uh, the 13th Amendment to eradicate slavery that in 1865. How many slaves were in West Virginia when it was uh, created? About, well, uh, 18 or 19,000, if we include uh, the eastern Panhandle counties. Well, the third issue that's uh, really hit upon uh, by the revisions has to do with the fact uh, that the state came in with a large uh, chunk of the territory of the new state uh, with people living who remained loyal to Virginia. And that uh, Curry, Curry book, uh, A House Divided, I think is very good on that, published in uh, 1964. And there's some real ground there for uh, Christopher Mill. There's ground for uh, lots of work, uh, historians' work. This civil war within a civil war. So uh, this is somebody's uh, map of uh, what West Virginia looked like, uh, I think, in 1862, 63. And you can see that the uh, uh, Union territory uh, does not cover all the map of, of where the state is. So, and we'll see here in a minute another map that'll explain this a little bit better. But basically what happened is I think the state makers uh, were too optimistic. After uh, McClellan's campaign, which uh, part of which initiated in Parkersburg, was mounted from the uh, Baltimore Highs uh, branch, um, <coughs> Went, went so successfully, so well, so quickly were the Confederates pushed out of uh, northern West Virginia that they expected uh, that that would continue. And indeed it was that uh, General Rosecrans uh, defeated the uh, Confederate forces in southern parts of the state at Carnifax Ferry. Uh, Wise's Legion was uh, routed and forced back, so it looked as if uh, that uh, the whole extensive area would be cleaned of, of rebels and could be part of West Virginia. And that didn't, didn't happen. After McClellan and uh, some of the other forces uh, went somewhere else, uh, uh, the rebels came back, so to speak. So you can call it a partisan war, a guerrilla warfare. Uh, it's a civil war within a civil war. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Civil War was, took place within the context of the borders of West Virginia. But both sides had forces from the outside that came in uh, to help them out from, uh, for the West Virginians, for the Union forces. Uh, forces from Ohio came in, perhaps as many as 20,000. For the people who remained loyal to Virginia within the boundaries of West Virginia, of course, they had support from the Richmond Confederate government, who sent in uh, forces and raids, but nowhere to the extent that the Ohio troops came in. That's one reason that eventually uh, West Virginia prevailed in this partisan imperial war. So they wanted to uh, uh, defeat the partisans, defeat the guerrillas, uh, to clinch their revolution. 
This is a, a map that was uh, developed by Richard Curry in that 1864 book, House Divided. And it shows the pattern in the May 23rd, 1861 vote on secession. Now this was uh, a referendum uh, during the uh, congressional legislative elections and people voted whether they favored secession or not. Uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia had already uh, taken military action and was in the process of joining the Confederacy even before this was ratified. But the value of this referendum is that it was taken before excuse me, military troops from Ohio came in. This was before McClellan came in. So people uh, were probably more inclined to, to vote their conscience. Uh, we do hear that there was some uh, coercion in some of the counties, but that's always the case in the 19th century because you voted by voice back then. You didn't vote with a secret ballot. So everybody knew uh, how you voted, and uh, those who were powerful and influential, well, they influenced your votes. That happened everywhere. But what you can see in the green, those are the counties that voted uh, in favor of secession. They voted with the Old Dominion. And then the white uh, are the counties that uh, voted against uh, secession. Now the pattern here is, is plain to me, it may not be plain to you, but uh, what we can see is that uh, the Ohio River counties, uh, including of course Wood County, uh, were against secession, uh, and uh, partly because they realized that a civil war, if it did occur, uh, well, they would be right on the battleground, right next to Ohio, and then also because uh, they were oriented economically and socially uh, towards the north and the west. They had the navigation of the Ohio River, navigation of the Canal River, and they also had the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which had been completed in the 1850s, This is not the, the greatest map of the Baltimore Ohio, but you can uh, see, I hope, uh, how it went through the northern part of the state. Uh, it passed from Harper's Ferry through uh, Martinsburg, and then skirted the Potomac, and then came into Preston County. Main stem went to Wheeling, and then the branch, Northwestern Virginia branch, uh, went from Grafton uh, to Parkersburg. The main sources of strength uh, for the state of movement and for the Union uh, in West Virginia were the B&O towns. And I think that is uh, pretty clear. Uh, when we look once again at the map, we can see that uh, not only do we have uh, those northern counties along the B&O voting against secession, but also the eastern Panhandle counties, uh, Berkeley and Morgan, uh, the influence of the B&O Railroad, uh, I think, cannot be uh, overestimated. The B&O had a very large facility in Martinsburg, and anytime the railroad uh, is in an area, lots of new people come in, uh, new markets open up, and I think that uh, had a very profound effect on uh, political loyalties. Of course, also the Northern Panhandle, uh, Ohio, for Ohio River, uh, Wheeling was a source, source of strength, Parkersburg, Clarksburg, uh, Grafton, uh, Martinsburg, uh, Fairmont, and then also Morgantown. Morgantown wasn't on the railroad. And then down in the Canal Valley, uh, Canal Valley, uh, the political leadership uh, were strongly Confederate, strongly pro-Southern. However, it seems as if the masses of people who voted uh, were not. Uh, we've seen that there were, uh, we know that there were several units uh, of Confederate troops organized uh, in this area, some of them uh, from the sons of salt makers, you know, the salt barons. Uh, but apparently the, the common people, the middle class, uh, uh, were against secession. Let's see what I do with this. Well, how did uh, Parkersburg uh, 
uh, play that role as guardian of the union. This is uh, Arthur Borman. Who does he look like? He is almost uh, identical. He has identical nose to Waveman Willie, same complexion, same color hair. You think? Look at him again. You don't see it? No. Well, it's really not that important. I can maybe do a study on that. Well, uh, of course, Parkersburg was one of the big and old cities, and uh, so it was the center of union strength. Uh, the indigenous people were, were strong in their statehood and union's views in Parkersburg, though there was uh, quite a bit of uh, Confederate Southern sentiment in Parkersburg. If you've looked at any of the sources uh, during that period, you'll see uh, there was quite a impressive minority sentiment for the South in Parkersburg and Wood County. Uh, Parkersburg epitomized what the new leadership stood for. These were the upperly mobile middle classes and they, they wanted a revolution because they wanted to overthrow political power of Virginia, advance, uh, make progress economically, socially, with education, with internal improvements. So they wanted to move up the ladder. And Parkersburg really epitomized that with uh, its capitalists uh, who were part of the oil boom of that period. And then, of course, uh, Parkersburg uh, was an entrepot for uh, Union troops. Thousands, perhaps, I think it could be over 100,000, uh, perhaps even more, that came through Parkersburg and used that uh, being a railroad line to uh, uh, first to fight in West Virginia and then also uh, later on to get transported east and then those who came west. So, quite a place. Uh, lots of people went through, lots of horses went through, lots of cargo went through. Uh, so this really revved up the city. And I did mention that uh, Parkersburg boomed economically. And uh, Ray Swint said the uh, Civil War made Parkersburg. And it just grew dramatically. There were uh, several uh, Parkersburg people who played leadership roles uh, in the statehood movement. Uh, uh, Peter Van Winkle, uh, William Stevenson, uh, Arthur Borman, the first governor of West Virginia. And then you have a very ambiguous role that uh, uh, Jacob Jackson uh, played. Uh, he was a Parkersburg uh, uh, judge and politician. And also just the bar. Uh, Distabar designed the state seal, and here you can see it on the right. Uh, and uh, what can you see that West Virginia stands for? Do you see the smokestack there? You see the uh, farming livestock in the front, but in behind, uh, you see the factories, you see the uh, Trey Run Viaduct, which is a railroad uh, bridge. And so I think this uh, brings in a clear view of the, the values of many of the state founders. They wanted progress. They wanted to invest and do business and make things grow. So I say they have a, a middle class origins of these people. And truly, I think it was a revolution for political equality and freedom uh, to do those things listed there. General improvements, education. I've already said those three times, I guess. But was it a revolution for political equality uh, for African-American slaves? No. No. And that, that, of course, could be seen from a president's point of view as, uh, as being signs of democracy. And it has been. It's been criticized for that. But that's not uh, the way that people thought at the time. 
I've compared this uh, to this idea that the Civil War was the so-called last capitalist revolution. These characters here, Barrington Moore and, and Mary and uh, Charles Beard, uh, have propounded the thesis that the Civil War changed America so dramatically that it was uh, in many ways similar to the English Revolution of the 1640s, 50s, and then the Glorious Revolution, and then also uh, the French and American Revolutions. Now, the only place in uh, the country that achieved a true revolution, a true political revolution, uh, was West Virginia. And of course, West Virginia was a revolution within uh, the context of the federal system, so that makes it uh, pretty unusual. So they're welcoming the, the market economy, and that's, that's one way to look at uh, what they're yearning for. They want to be tied into that market and uh, make some money. And this, uh, uh, this tie between uh, politics and economic development, you can see that today. That's sort of a legacy of this early period. Well, how about uh, a little bit of the guerrillas warfare, that uh, partisan warfare that uh, broke out between the different sections of the new state of West Virginia. I did a talk for the uh, faculty lecture uh, on that, you can see, back in 2011, and uh, set forth some uh, ideas, and I sort of followed up on some, so I'll report on that, on this. One interesting aspect uh, of the guerrilla warfare is the way that the, these people, especially the Confederate bushwhackers, are characterized by people from, mostly from Ohio. And uh, they're characterized in a sort of primitive, uh, colorful way. We'll see that here in a second. Well, this is what I learned about uh, this guerrilla warfare. And I just used these uh, terms, uh, Cavaliers. We know about the Cavaliers, uh, the Virginia Cavaliers. And they are also, by the way, uh, the forces that supported uh, King Charles in the English Revolution. So there are forces of conservatism there. I did learn that uh, guerrilla warfare was rampant. And what I have were some really good uh, sources uh, does anybody know David uh, McCain? Where is David? Well, he, he's done a lot of uh, young work and uh, research. And in the back of his uh, Northwestern Virginia Civil War are transcribed accounts of real activities in the Little Canal uh, River region. Most of them, well, maybe all of them, from the Wheeling uh, National Intelligence, the Wheeling paper. There were other papers around at the time, but the Wheeling paper gave the best coverage of, of these, these events. So very useful information. And of course, that's successful to, to everyone. It occurred, uh, this guerrilla warfare uh, occurred in particularly in certain areas that I'll highlight here in a minute, but there were even reports uh, of episodes up in Ohio County. Uh, so there were uh, dissidents uh, in other parts of the state uh, than in the counties that we saw a minute ago that voted for secession. We'll see a map here in a second. Both sides used not only uh, organized uh, uniform paid troops, they also used these uh, partisan or guerrilla troops that uh, were only very loosely affiliated with any military organization. Some of them acted independently, especially some of the Confederate bushwhackers. Well, was uh, guerrilla warfare uh, effective for the Confederacy? There's a long uh, ride in controversy uh, about guerrilla warfare, historians have suggested that if the South had resorted to guerrilla warfare, uh, it could have won the Civil War. But it's argued that uh, the South did not have the will to win that. Uh, and then uh, we all know, is it uh, 
Seven o'clock, DJ? Chris. He's got to go. I just, yeah, I can't. What time is it? I'm sorry. Oh, no. Well, okay. Uh, so the, uh, the guerrillas did uh, make an impact uh, on the war that waged here. They tied up lots of troops and in that way uh, hurt the Union effort. Um, however, uh, Robert E. Lee was not willing to, uh, uh, to do that. He was asked uh, at Appomattox, why don't you just take to the hills, disperse your forces, and fight a guerrilla war? He said, no, there's no way I'm going to do that because he had already seen enough, essentially. Oops. Guerrillas were organized into these uh, loose bands. Uh, those are just some of the names of them. You may have heard of the Moccasin Rangers. They're probably the most infamous of any of the guerrilla bands. Uh, in 1862, the Confederate Congress uh, passed a bill which sanctioned uh, their activities and gave them official papers. The idea was to prevent them from being executed on the spot uh, as, uh, as, uh, as traitors uh, by Union troops so they would get treatment as a prisoner of war. They were called partisan rangers. And this was Lee's statement about guerrilla warfare. He said, I regard the whole system as an unmixed evil. So he was not willing to countenance uh, guerrilla warfare, even to save the Confederacy. Well, this is uh, Rutherford Hayes. Uh, he was uh, an Ohio, uh, trying to think whether he was a general quite yet, but he later rose to presidency. So we know him from that. He had some excellent, uh, interesting comments about uh, uh, some of the guerrillas, the bushwhackers. Uh, while he was posted, he was posted at Weston, posted at Clarksburg for a short time, and then Gully Bridge for quite some time. And uh, his uh, letters are available here at the archives. They're very interesting, they're very quotable. This is one that, uh, that really interests me because uh, he's seeing these bushwhackers as primitive, as being almost a different species, that they had developed these uh, strange physical traits from being in the mountains and the woods. He's talking about bringing back a 230 pound gorilla, a mountaineer, and they were examining the body after they shot him. And uh, they saw that his, well, you'll see it there, he, uh, a very monster. He had long hooked toes fitted to climb, as if it was almost like a Bigfoot or a different species. So this is expressing the you know, the otherness that these Ohio people saw these mountaineers. And uh, this will be part of the stereotypes about uh, uh, West Virginians that would later develop. Lots of lady girls. This is the most famous Nancy Hart, or Peggy Hart. She rode with uh, one of the most notorious bands of moccasin uh, rebels, moccasin. And, uh, she wrote with Perry Conlon, who was the, probably the most notorious. Also, uh, Jane, Mary Jane Green, who was, uh, had this compulsion, compulsion to cut telegraph wires. And uh, she was uh, taken to the, uh, the West Virginia prison at Wheeling, the Antonia, and incarcerated there for a while. But she threw such tantrums and made such a fuss there that she was released uh, a Union captain said he hoped that some Union soldier would shoot her and get rid of her. She was such a, a terrible hassle. And as she was going back on the train, she saw some telegraph wires and got off and cut them. So she was unrecon unreconstructed also. And then there were other women who played roles in these groups. And, uh, you know, it makes you think maybe their uh, society and their, their norms, their Customs were different than those of the urban middle class. Uh, women were more egalitarian treatment than in uh, modernizing American cities. And then this idea of, of separate spheres for women and men, men and women here really hadn't sunk in yet, I don't think. More part of the traditional mountain culture. 
Well, if you want to pick a hero for uh, the uh, West Virginia uh, Mountaineer forces fighting against the Confederate bushwhackers, you might pick this fellow. This is John Cass Rathbone, uh, who was from the family of uh, Old Barons. Uh, the Rathbones had moved to Parkersburg in 1840 from uh, New Jersey, New York. They intermarried with the Van Winkle family and uh, began activity uh, in first the salt fields, you might say, and then the oil fields. So they came to exploit the mineral resources and uh, uh, there was a tremendous oil boom in Parkersburg during the first two or three years of the war. What ended the oil boom? At least during the Civil War. Does anybody know what happened in Brent Springs? Yeah, the Jones and Bowden Raid, 1863, they set fire to uh, the oil storage and machinery at Burning Springs. Tremendous conflagration. The first attack on uh, oil facilities uh, in world history. So anyway, uh, what, was, what made him distinct was that uh, he, uh, he recruited a, a regiment, the 11th Regiment, and uh, this was stationed more or less in the Burning Springs area to protect uh, his interests. He was a businessman. So you can see this combination of, uh, of capitalist, uh, military leader, uh, they're coming together here in this particular character. Uh, he also uh, created the so-called snake hunters. Uh, they were a company of men who used the same uh, methods as the guerrillas in counterinsurgency and uh, were able to capture many of them. Uh, they were led by a captain by the name of John Baggs, uh, who was described as a stalwart mountaineer, when in fact he was a plasterer from Steubenville, Ohio. But uh, most of them were recruited in West Virginia, some in Ohio. And that seemed to be the case with many of these units. But uh, as, uh, as it turned out, uh, the government couldn't put a guard on every person's farm. So this thing was very difficult to put down. You know, all insurgencies in Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, all these words are so difficult to put down. And he's using innovative methods, uh, the snake hunters. So uh, he had some success, uh, but it only lasted until uh, the last part of 1862. So they were trying to fight the guerrillas with these units, the 6th, the 10th, the 11th, the 12th. Uh, these were West Virginia units that fought against uh, the guerrillas and the partisan troops. But they also tried to win the hearts and minds of these people. They did it uh, with loyalty oaths. Uh, it was possible for a uh, ex-Confederate or ex-guerrilla to take a loyalty oath and then join a union unit. And that happened. It happened more than once. Uh, and also they were uh, sort of bribed with uh, bounties and bonuses for joining uh, West Virginia or Union, union uh, units. Well, who were the bushwhackers? Uh, these uh, two characters are the uh, most important figures in County. In county. Uh, to the left there is uh, George Silcott and then uh, the most important figure there is Peregrine Hayes. And there are members of a rural elite in Calhoun County. So I was trying to figure out perhaps there was uh, some similarities of the socioeconomic background, uh, some similarities in religious background, uh, things like that. So that's what I looked at next. And what I did using uh, a lot of the research that David did and also some lists I found here was to uh, look in the uh, 1860 census and uh, learn the evaluation that each of these uh, guerrillas and also home guards learn how much property they had in 1860 to measure their wealth. So that's the basic question. And, and I got started on this uh, way of thinking with this quote from uh, Rutherford Hayes. 
He said the secessionists in this region, he was in Weston, are the wealthy and well-educated and the vagabonds, criminals, and ignorant barbarians of the country, while the union men are the middle classes, law and order, well-behaved folks. And this points in the direction of the middle class revolution and then the guerrillas consisting of uh, not only the very top of the social orders in the loyalist counties, like these two uh, officials that, uh, that we saw a minute ago, and then also those uh, near the very bottom of the social ladder. You can see what General Cox said. Uh, he said something uh, analogous about Charleston, that most of the people who supported the Confederacy were well off, wealthy, the powerful. These were the uh, salt makers and their, and their sons and related. So I did a correlation study, and uh, I do uh, I do believe uh, that loyalties uh, were determined primarily uh, by conviction and belief, and I think that's true more of the Civil War than many other wars. That uh, most of the soldiers seem to be have a set of uh, ideas and convictions that they strongly believed in, but on the other hand. Uh, our ideas and beliefs are conditioned by our economic and social relationships. So I want to look at that as well. So I did this study and looked at uh, the wealth of uh, some rangers. Uh, for the most part, would be less wealthy uh, than the average Calhoun County head of household. And that the home guards, you know, representing the the middle class uh, would be more wealthy than average. So I looked at uh, Calhoun County, uh, and Calhoun is a fairly small county, that's one of the reasons I did it, and technically the average wealth for that county, it was uh, $866 in real estate and $251 in personal property. It's not a very rich county. It's not very rich today. Even. And then I got a list of names. Uh, from uh, a couple sources, mainly uh, Boyd Stutler's list. The Moccasin Rangers uh, found 43 of these guys. It's, sometimes it's difficult to find these characters. I think a lot of people uh, just weren't included in the census or they were somewhere else. Uh, so my Batting average was not particularly high for them. But I uh, looked at their wealth, tabulated it, and found out that of that total wealth of those uh, 43 uh, Moccasin Rangers, Peregrine Hayes had two thirds of it. Peregrine Hayes, he had $50,000. At least he reported that to the uh, census taker of a real estate property. And then uh, 10,000 personal profits. He's way up. He's, he's way up the wealth and economic uh, ladder. So that this skewed the whole result. The average wealth for Moccasin Rangers, you can see, was actually above the average with Peregrine Hayes in the equation. But you take him out, take him out, and the numbers change dramatically. So it goes below the average for the count. So it's below averages that you see there. So I, and I think it's legitimate to take him out because he does represent uh, what Rutherford Hayes said about the, the elites and then the lower class. And then I looked at some home guards, used a list from the West Virginia Adjutant General's papers here. And we're able to was able to find more of these people than uh, the Moccasin Rangers, and uh, their average uh, real estate values uh, you can see there uh, they were somewhat higher than average. So, what is this good for? A uh, quarter of get you a cup. Well, a quarter won't quite get you a cup of coffee with this, but uh, it uh, I think. <laughs> 
it is some sort of support for this idea that's put forth by Rutherford Hayes and, and other. There, I could quote other sources about the middle class origins of state leaders in West Virginia versus the uh, lower and upper class uh, origins of the Confederates. Hayes was uh, quite a character, had uh, seven of the nine slaves in Calhoun County, only nine slaves in Calhoun County. Expensive property. He was also the sheriff. So uh, it, there was a tendency to underestimate property values for the average uh, citizen because they were scared of getting assessed more. But to Peregrine Hayes, it wouldn't make any difference because he was the one who collected those taxes. So he may have overestimated his value just to look good. Oh, shoot, I still don't know. Well, the other thing that I did, and this is the last uh, topic thing that we'll look at, uh, I did a map. I wanted to uh, be able to locate as many of these clashes between guerrillas and uh, home guards or other units in this guerrilla war, warfare that were not part of the official records. Now, there is, is a series, there's a book, it's multi-volume work that is the official records of the rebellion. And it has 632 different uh, clashes. But very few of these uh, clashes of guerrillas and mountaineers are actually documented in it. So I had to look uh, at other sources, newspapers, adjutant generals' uh, papers. First of all, this map just shows the, the main area, the main theater uh, of this guerrilla warfare. You can see there was a swath of land uh, about, uh, I think it's about, 150 miles long from the Ohio River to the Pocahont to Pocahontas and the Greenbrier County, and about 75 miles wide. This swath uh, was really the territory where a lot of these battles were fought. Uh, one particular uh, correspondent said in an article, he said about the guerrillas, they roam with the ferocity of lions in the jungle in this area. Very colorful account. And uh, it's one thing you get from the newspaper, the colorful accounts. But this was the main area uh, where this activity took place. And then you'll see uh, down on, well, I'm scared to do this now, probably. Hit the wrong button. This line right here uh, was the Confederate line from uh, Mill Point down to Princeton. Mercer County. And they held this line uh, all the way up until late 1863. After the Battle of Droop Mountain, uh, they were forced out of that area. And what the guerrillas did from this area is that they stole horses and, and food and property from people in this area and brought them uh, to the Pocahontas, Randolph County areas, Lewisburg, Mill Point, and used them to supply the Confederate forces. So it was part of the Confederate war effort. And here's the map, uh, which is still draft, I have to admit, showing the various clashes that took place. Uh, the round blue uh, are the sites of uh, Union bases or camps, uh, several of those throughout this region. And then uh, the red are the bases for the guerrillas or partisans, Confederates. And then the red X, actually a little bit different shade of red. The X's are the clashes. Well, and now I realize it is hard to, to see from the distances, uh, and I don't expect you guys to ruin your eyes trying to look at that, but this, this is map was, uh, needs to be elaborated on. I want to work on it and key it to uh, distinct places. But you can see how widespread uh, this was. There were many other places that I couldn't locate. And what I did learn is that uh, the guerrillas uh, lived in localities that were cut off from major transportation routes. That seemed to be a common factor for them. Yeah, they lived up in the hollows, up in the areas that uh, really weren't uh, uh, that much penetrated by uh, market uh, forces, you know, transportation and, and turnpikes and roads. So uh, I think this was a very strong 
uh, correlation with the gorillas, their, their locality. So this is the conclusions I, I thought I made, maybe not, uh, that uh, statehood was indeed a, a, a real successful revolution of uh, white middle class capitalist uh, or political equality and freedom for themselves, for themselves. They, they hated slavery, they wanted to end slavery, uh, but they didn't want the slaves to be around. So they hated slavery in that way. And I think uh, we can conclude, at least I do, that it was constitutional. Uh, yes, Virginia, there is a West Virginia. Yeah, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. And opposition to slavery is based upon free soil ideas, not abolition. There were very few abolitionists anywhere in the country in 1863. Free soil was a prevalent idea. Keep slavery out of my backyard. But uh, there was some very important movement among uh, West Virginia leadership uh, from late 1862 to 1863 towards emancipation, urging, being urged by Lincoln and Congress. They moved towards gradual emancipation. West Virginia was the first slave state to emancipate slaves gradual emancipation. And then, of course, we established it was very much a house divided uh, during the war. There was a civil war within the civil war that took place here. And then uh, the last conclusion is that there were uh, social economic dimensions to that, but I really don't want to, uh, to highlight them that much, exaggerate them, because there were other very important factors uh, who you knew, your uh, religion came, was a factor, uh, other uh, sorts of ideas were factors, but uh, geography was also seen to be a factor, the fact that they lived in these rural, isolated areas. So I think that's why I've got these, just these uh, slides of, uh, that were in the National uh, Magazine, you know, showing, portraying the, uh, the grills, just a couple of these. And then uh, this is the last one. This is uh, Trey Run Viaduct, once again up in Rollsburg, that uh, stood uh, after a raid in 1863. It's on the, at the reverse side of the state city. So, does anybody have any uh, questions? I hope you do, or comments. Go ahead. Uh, when West Virginia's statehood began to look inevitable, um, and there were, the names for the new state were being considered. There must there must have been a hundred that were suggested, and in my personal opinion, would be 99 of those would have been preferable wouldn't we that we got. Uh, I mean, why, why do you go to the trouble to uh, becoming a new state and then just add West on the, the one that you had before? Well, I think it had been known as West Virginia for quite some time. It was familiar to a lot of people. Uh, Lincoln in the Emancipation Proclamation refers to West Virginia in capital letters. And so these new names, uh, well, uh, they didn't uh, apparently think that people in other parts of the world would be familiar. But it backfired, didn't it? Because now people confuse us with the very state that we hate and wanted to get away from. There's still people out there that don't recognize the fact that we are our own state. I run into that quite often. Well, uh, I don't know whether they're trying to needle us or what, uh, but I heard that also. I heard that recently a pilot, uh, a student who worked at a motel, he said a pilot flew into Charleston, uh, Yeager Airport, and uh, claimed he was in Western Virginia. So if a pilot doesn't know geography about West Virginia, we got problems. <laughs> There was uh, Canal was one that was uh, strongly considered. Uh, some people wanted Vandalia, which is beautiful. Um, Allegheny. Allegheny. And Western Virginia. Really? Mm -hmm. I think it would have been worse, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Anybody else? 
when, oh. I, when I went to school uh, down in Virginia Tech, um, and I had a he wore a t-shirt that said West Virginia State College on it, and, and I was, you know, people would ask me, like, I've never heard of that. Is that in Galax? Or what, people ask me, where, where is it? Well, 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 I hope you correct him. Go ahead. The only thing I would disagree with is where you said Stuart McGee was somewhat of a provocateur. Uh, anytime he lectured at our Canal Valley Civil War Roundtable, he'd always start off the lecture with, no, I'm here to rattle cages. And he certainly did. Uh, as for the legality, uh, in 2002, the California Law Review looked into the formation of West Virginia. And the conclusion they came to was that the formation of West Virginia was legal, probably. <laughs> well, <laughs> was uh, the secession of Virginia legal, constitutional? That's what I asked. Uh, that they had uh, dropped out of the Union, and uh, in the context of people's minds, what they were thinking, they they didn't know whether Virginia was going to ever come back in the Union. We know that now because we've looked at uh, the past that occurred after the Civil War, but the people who were in statehood, they didn't know that uh, Virginia would ever be a state again. So Virginia comes back and then makes all these claims, but uh, you know, they had committed suicide in terms of uh, uh, making many comments on constitutionality. You have commented that uh, Sherman's march either formally or informally, more or less originated in and around Parkersburg in that Wood County area. Now, or did I hear you correctly? Well, I may have misstated, misspoke, or misunderstood me, because I don't know why I say that. Uh, well, uh, so many troops went through Parkersburg. Okay. Uh, there was a, a large uh, group contingent of Union forces that passed through Parkersburg uh, to relieve uh, Union forces, Rosecrans, in uh, Tennessee. Uh, 20,000, something like that, that were brought forward because the uh, Union had lost the Battle of Chickamauga and uh, with the aid of Longstreet. And so there was something of a crisis. So they sent uh, uh, many, many troops through then, but I, I don't know how it would be related to Sherman. I'm sorry to give you that impression. To answer the gentleman's question about the name of the state, there were lots of people in this area who were still very proud of the fact that we had been a part of the state of Virginia. Virginia was a very important state back then, and they wanted to retain the name. In fact, I know a few historians to this day who think we should have kept the name Virginia and forced the folks at Richmond to call themselves East Virginia. <laughs> The federally recognized government of the true state of Virginia. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, Virginia was looked upon very highly uh, by many people in the Union. You know, it was the most important state in a lot of ways historically. Uh, I have the account of one Ohio soldier who talks about uh, moving into Virginia and he talks about uh, he had learned that it was the land of milk and honey and the great. Uh, greatest state in the world, and that is what he'd learned in school or from his parents. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Could have been more clever about it, maybe, yeah. you know, like you say. Didn't uh, Lincoln um, want to protect the B&O Railroad from Baltimore to Parkersburg, thus that's how the Eastern Panhandle was formed in part of West Virginia? Yeah, that's a big part of it. In fact, though, uh, the sentiment against secession, which you see in uh, that vote on May 23, 1861, in those two railroad counties, suggests that uh, uh, the very construction of the railroad and, and the movement of new peoples in, uh, possibilities of trade, uh, had already started uh, you know, that shift towards statehood, unionism towards the north, and then just naturally. Uh, they wanted to protect that because that was Lincoln's lifeline. Uh, it went to one branch, went to Washington, and supplied uh, uh, Baltimore and Washington. So uh, just coming on the heels of that. But they had lots of problems protecting the DNA.
Do you know about that? How much? Uh, oh gosh, it was like a task for Hercules. They really couldn't do it. Many of the early guerrilla really raids were against uh, the railroad, burning bridges. Didn't they burn that one there? The uh, no, uh, didn't get to it. That one survived. Yes, that's one of the few. Okay. You know, this war did uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars worth of damage to uh, property within the state. I mean, you could catalog the damage done during the Civil War. It's pretty impressive. Many, many beautiful bridges were destroyed by raids and guerrillas. For the guerrilla, what was their source of uh, pain? Well, uh, some simply uh, uh, used the five-finger discount. Um, they took what they needed. Um, now those within official uh, units, the raiders for the most part, uh, were paid. I don't think they were paid a whole lot. Uh, but most of the guerrilla units, they were not paid. So this, this was a disincentive for that and it encouraged them to raid them, or to plunder, not raid. And, uh, was one reason that some of them were willing to change sides because if they joined the home guards, there were actually 25,000 home guards that the Pierpont administration hired on with bounties, gave them uh, uh, rifles and uh, clothing. I mean, that was a strong incentive uh, to change sides. Many of them actually did. Surely somebody else has uh, some comment. You can say bad things too. <laughs> but you can't just say, oh, this was really good. <laughs> uh, a hypothetical question. If Virginia had paid more attention to Western Virginia, do you think that succession, of, I mean, uh, succession from Virginia would have, would, have, would have taken place? Because it sounds like mm -hmm. We, we, we weren't treated equal, but they thought we were, we were just a bunch of jailbells. They use the word peasants. But, uh, well, that is a really good point. Because actually what had been happening uh, in the 30 or 40 years before the Civil War is that Virginia had been incorporating uh, more and more regions of the West. They incorporated the, the Valley of Virginia in the 1840s and 50s. Uh, slavery was established there. They were connected by roads uh, to Richmond in the east. And then uh, uh, they began to uh, incorporate parts of, uh, of southwestern Virginia. They became uh, uh, more pro-Old Dominion and their loyalties and were tied in. So really, uh, they were in the process of doing that. And that's one reason Henry Wise was so upset, because when he was governor, he pushed for internal improvements for the western part of the state. And that's why he wanted to hold western Virginia all the way to the Ohio River. So maybe if we, the war could have waited for 20 years, uh, our secession may not have occurred. But my grandmother had 18 wheels, she'd be a Greyhound bus, too. <laughs> Surely somebody has uh, some sort of biting comment. Well, I sure thank you guys for coming out here because I know it's how difficult it is to get out. But uh, yeah, I think it's good. I just saw in the news before I came over that uh, uh, once you're, if you keep the ambient air temperature below 60, you burn a whole lot more fat. <laughs> So it's actually pretty healthy, I suppose. We don't have to worry about going to Zumba class tonight. But well, once again, I'm, I'm very happy you guys came. If you have any other questions or uh, want to introduce yourself, uh, I'll be here until they kick me out. So thanks a lot.